And welcome to episode 12 of the David Bernard Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Fox 8 meteorologist Zach Fredella, and we're going to be talking about insurance. Isn't that exciting, Zach? Everybody likes to discuss that. It's the number one topic, especially when we get into this time of year, hurricane season and and all the specific details and whatnot. Look, we already had a storm and an impact from a storm uh, just last week. Right. And kind of the reason I wanted to do uh, this podcast today is I've done this story a million times. We've done it in hurricane specials that flood insurance is really so important. And, and it's it's kind of the cheapest insurance that you can buy to protect your home. And at least for around here in Louisiana, the chance of you having your house burned down from fire is a lot lower than the possibility that you're going to flood. It, it really is. And a lot of people, I mean, for those that don't know, it is a separate insurance entity. You have your homeowner's insurance and then you have a separate policy that goes through flood. Um, but it's almost like it doesn't matter what area or what uh what you know specific uh, mapping is your of your home wherever it is you should have flood insurance if you live in louisiana you should have flood insurance and that doesn't that shouldn't make any difference where exactly you live in louisiana and of course on episode 11 uh which everybody can go back and listen to if you haven't already or watch uh we spoke with senior hurricane specialist eric blake of the national hurricane center and he had the distinct honor of naming uh, Claudette the other day. Now that caused a big explosion on my Facebook page for a couple of reasons. One, uh, the storm was named when it was over Homa. And uh, according to uh, Dr. Jeff Masters of uh, Yale Climate Connections and formerly of the famous uh, Category 6 um, uh, blog that he did through founding the Weather Underground, he had quoted, uh, I think, around a dozen storms since 1851 have been named over land. Now, the reason this caused such a stir uh, with folks is that, uh, as many people know, once you have a named storm that triggers separate wind and hail storm deductibles, which uh, I believe I'm not. It may vary by insurance carrier, but it can be anywhere from around two to five percent of your home value. Obviously, that's a lot of money, and so people were upset uh, that that was going to be the case. Now, that's a legitimate concern. Fortunately, with Claudette, I don't want to say fortunately, but uh, you know, Claudette, it was it was flooding, and as you start to say, Zach, the fact that it's flooding and most people didn't have wind damage, there's a difference there. Yeah, I like how you said that it's the wind and the hail. That's where the name storm aspect comes into these insurance policies. The flood insurance is through a totally different entity, and there's no type of name storm deductible that that comes into play. So the fact of the matter is, is most of our damage with Claudette was the flooding along the Mississippi Gulf Coast and also in you know the Slidell area. That flooding has nothing to do with the actual name storm deductible of your homeowner's insurance. And, you know, I think a lot of folks and uh, and Gilbert, um, Gilbert Giron from FEMA, he's the regional flood insurance liaison for Region 6, which includes Louisiana. Mississippi is actually in Region 4. He's going to talk more about the FEMA flood map process and, and some of the inherent risk. But I think it's important to point out, I mean, uh, that it's something like 25 to 30 percent of all flood claims, the National Flood Insurance uh, Program come from areas that aren't deemed high risk. And a lot of the New Orleans area has been taken out of the high risk flood mapping because of the improvement to the floodgates and the levee system after Hurricane Katrina. They, we rate the flood insurance based on uh, levee walls that protect us from storm surge, but also on the ability that you're able to flood based on your elevation just simply uh, from rainwater. And I think it's given people a little false sense of security. That's at least in the New Orleans area. But why don't you talk a little bit about uh, what can happen in areas, say, of new development where flood risk really uh, has not been tested before, particularly when we talk about the floods in 2016. Exactly. And I think that's probably, I mean, everybody remembers August 2016. And you want to talk about a storm that wasn't named over land, but very well could have been a tropical system in many regards. Was that August 2016 flood? It didn't have a name, but it was almost a tropical storm just sitting over South Louisiana. And the key there is it sat and it just it really wasn't moving much. And that's what dumped all that rainfall. But remember Denham Springs, all of that area north of Baton Rouge, you would never think north of I-12, um, you know, St. Elena Parish and, and Livingston Parish, how did they get that much water? Well, they got that much water 
And a lot of those people didn't have flood insurance just because it, it that's an inland location. Yeah, we know the, the regular um, area waterways, the rivers, the Comet River, they flood, but they've never flooded in our lifetime almost like that. And that was one of the most extensive flooding uh, events that we've seen uh, across South Louisiana. Now, most of that was on the North Shore and westward towards Baton Rouge. It didn't really in, impact uh, the New Orleans area. But I like what you said a minute ago. Um, where, you know, they, they're they changing these flood maps and, and they're changing these flood zones as the um, the, the protection gets better and, and, and such things. And I know Gilbert's going to, he'll probably speak to this a little bit more, but as those zones get updated, your flood insurance might change. And what if your flood insurance goes down? Some people might think, oh, well, maybe I don't need flood insurance anymore. And the, the, the more it goes down, the more you want to pay for it because that means, well, you're in a better position and it's also cheaper. So why not keep that flood insurance? And you also explained that in some situations, some folks are able to take lower amounts of coverage uh, to make it affordable, affordable. and some coverage um, is better than no coverage. Also in 2016, remember in March, we had the Great River Floods on the North really? Shore. Uh, yeah. and, and, and those records, uh, like for the Bogofalaya, is now the flood of record. Uh, yeah, and that was from a that was from just a stalled upper level low. I remember that system, and then what? Six months later, you had the August 2016 flood, which, you know, that was a really bad year of inland floods. It wasn't so much coastal floods; it was inland. And you know, another thing what we need to talk about in another podcast, and uh, we could go on forever about this, is development and how we plan development and where we develop. You know, there, there's, I think, some subdivisions even in St. Tammany Parish that are new that had some flooding recently. And, and you have to look at, you know, how well those are being planned out uh, as far as where they're being built in regards to floodplains. And I think we have multiple areas across Southeast Louisiana and South Mississippi where we're getting a lot of new subdivisions. Um, the homes are relatively close together and they have to have their own self-sustaining floodplain where the, the water has to drain from those houses into something. And as more infrastructure grows, as we put more concrete out there, we got to move the water. Back in the day when the water just sat over an open field, that was one thing. Now all of these new subdivisions you might look at your floodplain zone and be like, oh, I'm not in the flood zone. But two or three years from now, as more of those subdivisions pop up around you, guess what? You very well could be in a flood zone because the water has to go somewhere. Well, I want to remind everybody that uh, you can watch this podcast as well on the Fox 8 website, fox8live.com slash David. And if you're watching it right now, well, you can always listen to it. i got a lot of North Shore commuters that tell me that they've been listening to the podcast. And all you have to do is go to where you get your other podcasts and search for the David Bernard podcast. So on that note, and to talk more about flooding, uh, let's build, bring in Gilbert Giron from FEMA. Gilbert, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Appreciate you having me. Well, uh, we want to talk about flooding today, and particularly flood insurance. Uh, flooding, a massive problem here on the Gulf Coast, and of course our Fox 8 viewing area also covers South Mississippi. Uh, we're going to get into your role at FEMA, but uh, you cover the Louisiana sector. Mississippi is actually, I think, in a, a separate region. Why don't you tell us about what you do for FEMA as it relates to flooding? Of course. So my name is Gilbert Giron. I'm the Regional Flood Insurance Liaison for FEMA at Region 6. So Region 6 does encompass Louisiana, Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Arkansas. Uh, so my responsibility are to liaison between the insurance side of the National Flood Insurance Program and our customers. No matter what state you're in, and if you're in Region 6, I'm the person you'd call to to help you resolve any issues that haven't been able to be taken care of by your insurance provider or you're not getting the cooperation you think you need to with your adjusters. Um, if your premiums are, um, you believe, high, uh, we can do a review of your of your policy to make sure it's properly written. And we can help with any uh, claims if they're being partially or hopefully denied. We can find out why. Uh, it's my job to make sure that you have everything you're taking of. We're in a contract when you write, when you buy a flood insurance policy. My position is to make sure that everything that we are obligated to provide in that contract is given to you. So let's let's talk about flooding. Is this really the most costly and damaging man-made or natural disaster, I guess we should say, out there? I mean, to, to me, it seems like that's what we see the most. 
Well, let me give you some numbers. Uh, since 1973, there has been 465,293 claims paid in Louisiana. That is totaling $15.6 billion in claims paid. That's billion with a B. That is a staggering amount of uh, insurance that has been paid out for a natural event. So yes, it is very costly, and it's even more costly for those who are not prepared. For those who are able to file a claim, they're able to help get back into their house faster, get back in their way of life faster. For those who do not have flood insurance, I, I just can't imagine the, the stress on top of already living through a disaster on how they're gonna rebuild. So what, what do you think most people misunderstand the most about flood risk? Well, flood risk is identified uh, in conjunction with FEMA, our engineers, also in cooperation with local communities, uh, flood control districts, right? We try to get the best ground data available and we give maps, but our maps are based on a 1% annual event, okay? And we have some areas that have never experienced 1%. So people are under the impression that it's never flooded here before, it's never gonna flood again. Well, we have some areas that have exceeded that 1% multiple times per year. So people have, a, I, I believe people have a hard time understanding simply because I have not flooded now does not mean you won't flood again in the future and trying to articulate in that way people can understand that first off the entire country is a floodplain it's just a question of what zone you reside in and if you live in a high uh, moderate to high risk zone you more than likely you have seen some flooding action but for those who live in what we call the X zone or X shaded area of minimal flooding you're still just as much to prone, uh, prone to flooding in those areas as those of high risk. And Zach, why don't you uh, talk a little bit uh, uh, to Gilbert about how they assess that risk and who, you know, who makes this stuff? Yeah, like uh, you're saying, you name like there's the X zone, there's the A zone. Who, I mean, I know FEMA generates those maps, uh, but who, where do you get that information from? Like what is, what kind of go into the process of how those zones are made up and by who? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we work, we have contractors and we also have uh, uh, professional engineers who are employed by FEMA. Well, they go out there and they do uh, any numbers of uh, modeling. They can use LIDAR, they can get on the ground, actually shoot the information. Uh, and they, what they will do is they will com complete a model. And that model will, will determine based on all the variables involved with the engineering and with the cooperation of the communities, that will determine the zones. Now the more detailed the model is, the more detailed information we can give to the communities. I'm sure some of you are aware that an A zone in FEMA's eyes is an unnumbered A zone. That means more than likely it's not a large population area, it's not a large area of population growth or, or of uh, structures in place. So we don't provide detailed information because the costs associated with that can be staggering. But those areas who do have a large population uh, and large uh, development, more than likely we'll have detailed information where we will break down the zones. We will give AE zones, we will provide BFEs, we will provide a flood insurance study, and we give those to the communities so they can ensure that the information is accurate. And during the mapping process, we give them an appeal period. So if they find that they don't agree with our maps, they can appeal it based on technical data. So their engineers can run it, the modeling, determine if our uh, accuracy is acceptable, and if it is, they can just accept our maps, uh, what we, uh, call as a compliant and uh, the maps will over a time period will become effective and then that's what will be used for effective maps. So, now I know we have some some areas like the infrastructure is rapidly growing you know one area in our viewing area is the North Shore. How often do y'all generate these maps? Is there a set schedule? Well that is a great question. Well let me start off by uh, telling your viewers that our maps are a snapshot of time okay and at that time you're given the most accurate maps that we can create. Well, over time, things can change, like you just mentioned, based on growth. Well, that change could have an impact on the maps. So we look at maps about every five years, uh, but just because we look at the maps doesn't mean you're getting new maps. It'll get to the point where the ground truth is no longer accurate enough in which the mapping modeling is uh, applied for. And then with um, uh, conjunction with the state, we will start remapping areas. Now there are times where uh, during a disaster, uh, we can do mapping for emergencies um, and help them understand if the ground truth had changed drastically. Um, we did that uh, um, in Denham Springs. Uh, I forget the exact time frame of the flooding. But 2016 we most likely. We, had, we issued advisory BFEs 
uh, to help the community understand that the maps are going to change and there's going to be a drastic change to help them. Yeah, that's interesting. We were going to uh, definitely bring up the uh, 2016 floods with you uh, as, as a significant event. And obviously, as what Zach was alluding to, is that the problem was uh, in the area, and this is around Baton Rouge uh, and east of the Baton Rouge area, uh, many of all of these subdivisions were new. Uh, and we're seeing explosive growth in these areas. And so the question is, you know, is did we realize how flood prone those areas were? Was this really just on the extreme high end of events? You know, that was something that I guess wasn't factored in uh, before these homes were built. Well, one of the things to remember that when communities join the National Flood Insurance Program, it's a quid pro quo program, right? Something for something. Uh, the community agrees to adopt and enforce FEMA minimum criteria, and in return, they're, uh, they're allowed to join the NFIP and offered affordable flood insurance. Well, minimum criteria is the key word here. Okay, so a lot of our minimum criteria is same across the country. Uh, what we are looking for is the communities to understand that our minimum criteria may not be enough and for them to adopt higher standards. For them to understand that, okay, if FEMA says there might be a fee, has to be three feet. Let's say, no, well, wait a minute, three feet because of historical flooding. We may want that to be five feet. So we need to include freeboard in our ordinance to provide a higher level of protection to make the community more resilient to flood um, flooding events. Well, and then, but a lot of that also then goes into it varies by state, doesn't it? By uh, building codes and and things like that. That that can that vary state by state. I, I believe some of this flooding could have been prevented if the freeboard had been just a little bit higher. In fact, on average, if you increase it in most areas just by a foot or two, you're going to you would have eliminated. I know in the case of 2016, most of the flooding that happened. Absolutely right. We encourage communities to review and adopt international building codes, but that's a higher standard. And you know, some communities, larger built up areas are. Um, uh, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm going to switch over to Texas. Houston has adopted uh, international building codes in some communities in Louisiana. But that's a higher standard. That's not a requirement. But the higher standards of the IBC definitely help when it comes to the resiliency aspect of uh, individual homes. The higher it is, the more resilient it's going to be, the more mitigated it is. And also it's going to offer a better insurance premium. Well, and this gets back to the whole mitigation and adaptation aspect of uh, not only natural disasters, but climate change and all these big issues. And, and not to get you too much uh, in the middle of all this, but this is politics is what we're talking about. And what it's happening in a lot of states and not just with uh, flood insurance, uh, but just also with building codes is you get the lobbyists and you get the construction people in there and, uh, you know, they want to make the codes as low as possible to reduce their cost for building. But the reality is the amount that it costs in addition to mitigate against that possible flood or that windstorm damage is exponentially less to what we end up paying out in these huge disasters. I mean, that's kind of the 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 sad part of the whole thing. Yeah, a lot of the things in the NFIP can be political and sensitive in nature, but it's one of the things that we have. Uh, let's use substantial damage as an example. I won't. I don't want to get too much into this, but it is a way to break the perpetual cycle of flood rinse and repeat on houses that we have flooded multiple times. Um, we just encourage the community, the citizens themselves, to speak up to their elected officials. Uh, ask for these higher standards. It helps the community become more resilient. We understand there's costs associated with uh, elevating two, three, four feet above the BFE. But as you mentioned, it will save you over the lifetime of your home. You won't have water. Uh, I won't say you won't have water, but if you do, it'll experience less. Uh, but mitigating a home is the one of the best avenues to protect your your one of your single largest investments, and more importantly, get you back into way of life after a disaster event happens. All right, so what's wrong with this statement here? Um, I don't live in a high-risk flood zone. Maybe I'm in a zone X, so I don't really feel like I need to carry flood insurance, particularly if, let's say, uh, you know, you've cleared your mortgage and it's not required anymore and you've, and you've paid off your house. What, what's, what's wrong with that statement? Well, I'm going to go back to when I first joined FEMA in 2015. I was deployed to Oklahoma, disaster 4222. 
Uh, I was a floodplain compliance specialist at the time, and I reached out and I, I spoke to communities, made sure they had uh, everything they needed. But one of the things that shocked me the most is when we got the data that indicated that 60% of damaged structures, right, that had floodwaters, were outside of FEMA identified special flood hazard areas. They were in the X zone areas, the area of minimal flooding. And that number has not decreased since that time. In fact, it has increased. Even Hurricane Harvey, we were over 65% of damaged structures were outside of FEMA special flood hazard areas. So I think it's misleading. Uh, once again, I'm going to go back to that uh, analogy that the entire country is a floodplain. It's just a question of what zone risk you reside in. And if you're in a zone X and you don't think you could flood, I just direct you to those numbers. A lot of houses outside of FEMA identified special flood hazard, hazard areas are the ones experiencing the damage. And Zach, why don't you talk about the uh, 100 and 500 year flood and uh, maybe Gilbert has a better way of uh, explaining that to our listeners out there than we've tried to explain. Yeah, I mean, it's probably the most difficult thing to explain is the 100 year flood, uh, the 500 the, the year flood. And I mean, especially from a television perspective, you know, the viewers, we don't have a lot of time. And so, I mean, what is your best definition for if you live in a 100 year floodplain or if you live in a 500 year floodplain? What is what does that mean to people? OK, first, I would like for us to stop using those terms. They are confusing <laughs> and misleading. Uh, when we talk about the 100 year floodplain, people are in the impression that they flood this year. They're not due again for 99 years. It's the same thing with the 500 year. That's not the case. It, we now we call them the 1 percent annual chance of flood and the 0.2 percent annual chance of flood. And you'll notice I said annual chance of flood because these can happen any given year. Now, I use an analogy when I teach classes. So imagine you have a, a jar of marbles. You have 100 marbles. One of them is red. Every morning you put your hand in that jar of marbles and you pull out one. You have that one chance of grabbing that red marble. And every day you start anew with 100 marbles. It can happen any given year. And a lot of times we see it multiple uh, events of, that exceed the 1% annual chance of flooding. So with that being said, they are high risk flood zones. So the 1%, that's where you're going to have your A's, your AE's, um, very high risk. Now the 500 year, the 0.2% is a shaded X. It's a non, a non regulatory flood zone, but let's be realistic. Uh, it's they're separated by a white line on a map. Those, that white line is called the boundary map. And every 0.2% floodplain is going to touch a 1% floodplain. And in, what we are expecting is that white line on that map to stop the flow of water. In reality, we know it's not. Water is going to go where it wants to go, and it's going to pass that white line. And that X zone shaded is a moderate flood risk. So uh, 1%, you know that you're in a high-risk flood zone. And in a shaded X, uh, or the 0.2%, you know that you're in a moderate flood risk zone. So New Orleans, okay. <laughs> Um, <laughs> a lot, I'm in zone X, I'm winning, right? No, but yes, I am in a zone X here in New Orleans. I am in one of the higher portions of the city, which is all relatively speaking. Um, but a few years back, uh, we had new FEMA flood maps, uh, issued for the city. The city didn't like it. Uh, they protested and, uh, they won. And as a result, uh, the maps were adjusted and a large swath of the city uh, was moved into a zone X. And that's significant because um, the flood insurance is cheaper uh, if you live in a zone X. And which, of course, means that potentially the government is going to have to pay out more uh, uh, for, for some of these floods that are, are likely going to occur. When you talk about the flood risk, particularly in New Orleans, we really have two different things going on, right? The reason, the, the argument, what was the, I'll let you explain it. What was the city's argument for saying that our flood risk should be lowered from what FEMA had originally designated a large part of the city? Was that a question for me? Yes. I, okay. So I, I wasn't present on the mapping aspect of this. I'm more aware of the outcome. Uh, so I can speak on that, but uh, the appeals, as I mentioned in the mapping process, each community is given the opportunity to appeal. Uh, I think the appeal was based on the certification aspect of certain levies in and around the area, and the outcome was a positive in, in regards to New Orleans. With that being said, let me go ahead and, and move on to 
what is an egg zone protected by levy okay well i think a lot of your your listeners already understand that levy is just not the just not a levy it's a levy system it's a flood control system and we are assuming that everything in the levy control system is working and functionally properly as it should examples are the pumps or the there's no blockage of the uh, the main pipes uh, gates are closed properly, right? When all that works in, in conjunction, then the area is considered a zone X protected by levy, which does offer very affordable flooding. But let's take uh, 2016 flooding, for example. Uh, pumps were not working. There was blockages in the drain pipes, which led to flooding in areas where that should have been protected by the levy. So even though that the zone is certified, uh, does have certified levy systems and offers the X zone rates, but we have to understand that it's still some risk. If that flood control measure fails on a large scale, there is a good possibility, everyone understands that Louisiana is kind of like a bowl, that water can't be pumped out and people will experience flooding. So for those of you who had mandatory purchase for, uh, for the uh, area, uh, that was protected by levy, uh, I encourage you to keep your flood insurance. The, the rates are going to be a lot lower now that mandatory purchase doesn't apply. You can also purchase the amount of coverage you can afford. If uh, $250,000 for the building is unattainable, get $100,000 in coverage. Anything is going to be better than relying on individual assistance if a flooding event ever does impact that area. So technically, I mean, just kind of listening and, and so technic from a technicality perspective, the levees are protecting us from storm surge. So those maps are compensating for that, but also the pumps within the city to protect us from rainwater as well. Yes, it's like I said, it's part of the, the uh, flood control measures. It's not a lot of people think of a levee. They just think of that 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 dam, that earthen dam or, you know, the gates that keep the water out. But it's the entire system uh, that is certified. And that, and that was the argument from the city is that after all the upgrades to the levee system because of Hurricane Katrina, that we should have a better, a better flood rating. But the reality is the drainage system, uh, that has not been improved. And everybody listening knows it, it, it's a crisis is really what it is on a number of levels, not just because of the age of the system, but uh, even getting viable power. But uh, the good news is there's been an announcement this week uh, that Entergy is going to be building a power plant on site uh, at the Sewerage and Water Board, and it's going to allow them to eventually phase out these, these turbines that are over 100 years old that power the system. And so we're going to at least have reliable energy. It doesn't bring up the fact that We've got old pipes and, you know, everybody's aware of all the various uh, issues going on. But I did want to address that because uh, there's many people and many of my viewers uh, I know who feel like, oh, great, we don't need flood insurance now. We're either in a lower risk zone, so we probably won't flood. Or there's people that as soon as their house is paid off, hey, everyone's looking to cut expense and they drop flood insurance. And it's really, you know, one of the cheaper forms of insurance you can get and it's the highest risk of what's likely going to happen to your house I and mean, what what's the chance of that versus say a fire for instance oh um, i don't have the exact numbers in front of me but i know the uh, the odds of flooding are far greater than the odds of you experiencing a fire in your home now what are the options for flood insurance um if are there private ways of obtaining flood insurance now as well or is it all just through uh, NFIP, National Flood Insurance Program. No, I'm happy to say that there's a lot of private uh, sector products available that will cover flood insurance. In fact, some of these private products uh, can equate to the uh, uh, coverage offered under the NFIP, uh, therefore meeting that criteria for mandatory purchase. Uh, my only concern, and uh, we've had no issues with private insurance not paying out, my only uh, concern is uh, rewriting after major events. Um, private uh, providers can choose what areas that they want to write their policies in. Well, NFIP will uh, write policies in any location and we'll write policies for any building, even those that are not compliant, even those that have experienced multiple flooding events. Now, premiums will be adjusted to reflect the risk there, but we will write policies. We won't, we won't be able to uh, uh, pick and choose which policies we want because our risk may be too high in some areas and, and more favorable in others. So let's kind of sum up here, uh, Gilbert, for everybody, uh, the reasons why you should get flood insurance 
and the options for flood insurance within the National Flood Insurance Program. I thought that was a point you made earlier that was good, that you can kind of pick and choose now the amount of coverage that you want based on what you can afford, uh, just to give everybody an understanding of what's out there. Well, first I'd like to remind everyone uh, that flood insurance is a single pair of policy, okay? It is not included in your standard homeowner's insurance. I hope uh, people understand that. Um, I still get calls all the time that, um, you know, my, I uh, filed a claim and they denied it. And for me to do research on it, as for the declaration page, come to find out, uh, they submitted a claim for their standard homeowner's insurance, which is obviously going to deny flood insurance claim. Uh, as for the, the type of products out there, we have what's called the preferred risk policy. For those of you who reside in a zone uh, X area of minimal flooding, this will be the best option for you. Uh, there is some eligibility requirements. I would encourage you to get quotes with licensed agents in your area. Uh, find out which product is best for you. We have standard flood insurance policies, and it depends on the situation of the home. If the house has uh, prior flood loss history, uh, we, we may have to go with a standard flood insurance policy, but um, the standard uh, I'm sorry, the statutory amount that is allowed for coverage on a building is $250,000. Um, in some cases, if uh, that's just too much, uh, we encourage people to get with their agents, tell them thank you for offering me the maximum amount. That is beyond my capabilities. Let's talk about $150,000 in coverage. Let's talk about instead of $100,000 in content, let's talk about $50,000 in content. Let's see where that premium comes up to. It makes, uh, uh, kind of customize it to the affordability for each individual. In, in, I'm sorry, individual uh, customer. Um, everyone has their own variables and houses are rated on individual variables as well. So um, we often get people confused about my neighbor's paying this and I'm paying that. Well, it's like comparing apples to oranges. So a lot of variables go into rating a flood insurance, such as the original construction date of the home, uh, the lowest floor elevation, location of the machinery and equipment, the type of construction of the home. Uh, the diagram for the foundation is it properly does it have properly flood vented um, all those go into play to uh, determine the true cost of flood insurance so that's why it's so important for your your listeners to to reach out to a licensed flood insurance or licensed insurance agent in the area and ask them if they write flood insurance I would start with the insurance provider you have for your your homeowner's insurance and auto and see if they write flood insurance if that doesn't play out then just do a simple search or they can go to floodsmart.gov uh, which will go by zip codes and offer agents in the area to write flood insurance. And what about for renters? Ah, great question. I love this question. Renters can get content only insurance. In fact, uh, you need to. I guarantee you that the owners of the building that you are renting from have their investment protected. But the content is not included. So the renters can get content only insurance and it's going to be a few hundred dollars for thousands of dollars in coverage. Um, I remember my analogy about putting your house in the palm of your hand, turning it upside down and shaking it. Everything that falls out is your content. And most people will accumulate that over years. Now imagine trying to have to replace all that at one time. It would be very, very expensive. So renters, I encourage you, contact your agents. Tell them that you want renters flood insurance. Now if anyone is told that they can't get flood insurance because they live outside of the special flood hazard area, um, send me an email and I will handle that issue. The only uh, requirement for them to be able to purchase flood insurance is that the community is a participating member in the National Flood Insurance Program. And I, just to add a little extra point to this, I was one of those mistakes that didn't get flood insurance when I was renting right out of school. I moved to Lake Charles for um, my first job in television. And sure enough, we had one of those rogue storms drop six to eight inches. I came home to water all my, all my belongings in water. So definitely don't forget, if you're a renter, get the flood insurance. It, now, that was now, a big mistake. Now, I didn't know that, Zach. I guess the only good news is, is I don't know how many content you had right out of college. but <laughs> Not many. <laughs> <laughs> I remember me. I had a TV tray, a sofa, and I don't know, maybe a TV. Look, <laughs> one thing that did get water was my diploma. It was actually on the floor that day, and my diploma got wiped out. So. Well, there you have it. Gilbert, thank you so much for uh, joining us today on the podcast and bringing some perspective and uh, much needed information about what really is the greatest threat here in Southeast Louisiana and the Gulf Coast, water. And we've seen a lot of it lately and we know more of that is gonna be on the way. 
I just have one closing comment, if you don't mind. Uh, sure. For any of your listeners who may be considering flood insurance, uh, please be aware that there is a 30-day wait for new business policies. Um, unfortunately, we've already had some events uh, happen where someone bought flood insurance, uh, and they were only two weeks into that 30-day wait, and their claim was denied because of that 30-day wait as a requirement. So please, hurricane season is here. Don't delay much longer. Find that insurance policy through your agents. Start the process. Get it going, and you still have to wait 30 days before that policy is in effect. And I would just add, before you came on, Zach and I were talking about wind and hail deductibles. Uh, that's a whole separate issue uh, in the private insurance business and with name storms and, and, and that sort of thing, how it impacts uh, uh, what is going to be triggered as far as people's deductibles. But as far as the flood insurance goes, there's the 30-day uh, waiting period. But does a uh, name storm have anything? It doesn't I mean it's just a pure 30-day waiting period regardless yes, of what's going on. Exactly. Now, the name, uh, having a storm named does not really infect uh, in the way insurance is paid out. Uh, the definition of a flooding by FEMA eyes is two or more uh, acres of normally dry land are inundated with water or two or more properties, one of which is the policy holders are inundated with water. That, that equates to a flood. So any claims can be submitted. We don't rely on having it named uh, to, to have to initiate that. And with the other deductibles, be mindful, as I mentioned earlier, that the flood insurance is a single peril policy. Our flood insurance will only cover flooding. So if you're in an area where you have um, high winds and it's hairy, uh, hail, uh, those are going to be separate policies, separate riders that you'll have to ensure that you have coverage on your own. All right, Gilbert, thank you so much for being on the podcast today, and let's hope we all stay dry. Thank you very much for having me. So some good information there from FEMA, from Gilbert. Um, Zach, do you have any closing thoughts on flood insurance and flood risk? What we know as meteorologists is if it can rain, it can flood. And so, you know, you should always have that ability and you should always have the, you know, flood insurance. And that, that's the reality. When you have that conversation with Gilbert, you know that, I mean, here in South Louisiana, South Mississippi, even if you paid off your home, even if you don't have to carry flood insurance, now some policies, if you, if you, you do have to carry flood insurance, but if you don't get it, and especially if you're in those good zones, I mean, if you're in those zones that are not flood plains, that means your flood insurance is going to be cheaper and it's worth it because like I mentioned a second ago, if it rains, it can flood. And we do live in South Louisiana and South Mississippi. It can flood pretty easily in many areas. All of those excellent and good points. Thank you, Zach. Thanks, everybody else, for listening. I'm David Bernard. Stay safe, everyone, and we'll see you next time on episode 13.